I wait here. Ten years. I'll match ten years. Agreed. Wondering how it's played? I understand. It's a game of deception. So any crew member can be challenged. Why? Anyone. I challenge Davy Jones. Today we're reviewing a hand between two of the best cash players in the world, Linus Love and Davy Jones, which comes to us from High Stakes Podcast, A-Game. In this video, we'll offer a heuristic to devise rational bet sizings for almost any scenario. So these guys are playing three-handed, 50-100 on ACR, and Davy Jones opens the button with pocket jacks, Linus then three bets from the small blind with ace-nine suited, Davy four bets, and Linus calls. This is all relatively standard according to these 1KNL ranges from GTO Base that we'll be using for purposes of this analysis. The flop is Ace Queen 3 Rainbow, and Davy C bets very small around 15%, which the solver does in this spot with its entire range. You may recall that in our last video, we featured a very deep stacked hand and discussed at length how that impacted bet sizings. When SPR gets higher, bet sizings tend to become more stratified as the strongest hands will have an incentive to bet larger to try to get stacks in by the river. But when the stacks get shallow, sizings tend to become more compressed because it becomes easier to play for all the chips. And this dynamic definitely is very relevant in most 4-bet pot scenarios, as we can see by these aggregate reports, which show the overall betting frequencies across all possible flops. On the vast majority of flops, the predominant bet size used is the smallest one. So is this why the solver is betting small in this particular hand? Well, in this case, no it's not. If we run this exact same sim, but increase the SPR to 4 or even 10, we see that the solver continues to favor the small sizing. So if it's not the SPR, what is driving the bet sizing? Well, another important factor when it comes to bet sizing is nut advantage. As most of you know, a player has a nut advantage when he has a higher likelihood of holding a very strong hand. The player with the nut advantage is generally allowed to bet larger with both his value and bluffs. So is Davy's lack of nut advantage the reason why he's betting small here? Well no, that's not it either. If we compare the equity distributions of the players where the strongest hands are represented in red, it's likely that Davy actually has a significant nut advantage on this board, with aces, queens, ace-queen, and ace-king. So if neither the SPR nor the nut advantage are the main drivers for this small bet, what is? villain's equity distribution. In this case, on this particular board, Linus has what we refer to as a bottom heavy range, with a high likelihood of holding a hand with very poor equity, represented by these dark blues and purples. Recall that this was a small blind versus button spot, so much of Linus's range consists of lower pocket pairs and suited connectors that are performing extremely poorly on this flop. Davy just has so much ace-x or better, which these hands are drawing very thinly against. So given Linus's likely range composition, what are the incentives of Davy's most probable hand classes from an EV perspective? First, let's think about Davy's strongest hands like aces, queens, ace-queen, or ace-king. With this class of hands, he doesn't really want to bet too large because it would likely cause so much of Linus's range to fold, resulting in Davy missing out on additional value on later streets. If Davy instead bets smaller, a greater proportion of Linus's range should call, which Davy can potentially extract more value from in subsequent nodes. Now let's think about Davy's weakest hands, like King-9 suited or King-10 off. What are their incentives? Well, they want Linus to fold. But this doesn't mean he should just try to get as much of Linus's range to fold as possible, because that would mean jamming all in. Instead, bluffs generally want to be efficient, meaning they want to risk as little as possible to get as many folds as possible because there's always a chance that villain will call. And so when villain's range is bottom heavy, a small bet will often be used because it should be effective at getting many folds. 
And for Davey's mid-strength hands like pocket jacks or tens, he has multiple different incentives which can be satisfied by a small bet. A small bet should get some value from hands like king-10 and king-jack, and at the same time get protective folds from hands like king-9 or 10-9 of spades with double backdoors. So from an EV perspective, most of Davey's range will gain some benefit from firing a small bet. And in game theory land, we generally prefer to take actions that many hands in our range have incentive to take because it helps disguise our hand and our strategies. Now let's contrast this board with a different one, Jack-10-8. On this board texture, we see that the betting scheme completely changes. The small bet is not used at all. Instead, the larger ones are used exclusively, including a 150% all-in shove. And since all of the parameters of this sim are the same, except the flop, this difference is driven by villain's equity distribution relative to the board. Whereas on the ace-queen-3 board, Linus's range was very bottom heavy, on this jack-10-8 board, Linus's range is more aptly characterized as being mid-heavy, represented by oranges, yellows, and greens. Linus has many more connections to this board, such as Jack-X, 10-X, and 8-X, as well as hands with plenty of outs to improve to a strong pair or better, like Ace-Queen and Ace-9. In fact, if we isolate all of Linus's unmade hands, we see that the vast majority have some sort of draw. Against this type of range, Davy's strong hands can get more calls using a larger bet, Davy's weak hands will need to bet larger to generate significant folds, and most of Davy's medium hands don't have a high incentive to bet, because a large bet won't get much worse to call, but a small bet won't get many protective folds. So does this mean that villain's equity distribution is the most important factor that drives bet sizing in all scenarios? Well, not exactly. If we take this same board and the same ranges, but increase the SPR to 10, we see that the solver goes back to using the small sizing only. The reality is that all of these factors are important at the same time, which raises the question. How does one synthesize all of these different considerations in a rational way? Well, as is the case with most things GTO related, there is no bright line clear cut answer we can give you, but what we can offer is a simplified two step heuristic that can help guide your value betting process in almost any scenario. The first step in our heuristic is to identify who has the nut advantage, which tells you the maximum amount you're generally allowed to value bet in a given situation. As noted earlier, a nut advantage is characterized as having a higher proportion of the strongest hands. As a practical matter, this means the hands that want to play for stacks by the river, and this is where the interplay with SPR becomes relevant. As the stacks get deeper, the threshold for hands that want to play for all the chips gets higher, and when the stacks are more shallow, the threshold for hands that want to play for all the chips gets lower. To elucidate this point, let's explore these ranges a bit deeper. So in the deep sim, the equities for each combo in both ranges will be equal to the equities for the same combos in the shallow sim. This is because SPR does not impact equities, which simply tell us the likelihood for a hand to win if both players go all in with no further action. So in this case, in both sims, aces have around a 64 to 68% chance to win if both players go all in at this moment. The small differences in percentages are due to backdoor flush possibilities and card removal. And queen nine, the current nuts, has around 84 to 90% equity in both sims. However, although SPR doesn't impact equities, it does heavily impact EV, which tells us how many chips on average a hand is likely to win by taking a particular action. So in the shallow sim, if the button bets $7,600 with aces, he should expect to profit around $3,600 to $4,100 on average. Whereas if he bets this same amount with queen nine, he should expect to profit around $6,400 to $7,100. So the average EV ratio between aces and queen nine at this SPR is a bit less than one to two. However, in the deep sim, if the button bets 7,600 with aces, he should expect to profit around 1,500 to 2,700 dollars, which is lower than it was in the short SPR sim. And if he bets the same amount with queen nine, he should expect to profit around 9,600 to 10,600 dollars on average, which is much higher than it was in the short SPR sim. And this comes out to an average EV ratio of closer to one to five. 
Remember, EV takes into account both the number of chips won and lost across all possible scenarios. So when the stacks are shallow, the number of chips that one can lose is strictly limited, but when the stacks are deeper, the effective stop loss will be proportionally higher with more behind to play. As a result, as the stacks get deeper, the impact of equity differentials tends to become more amplified. So in the shallow sim, we see hands as weak as second pair shove, despite the fact that the equities of these hands are not great. Whereas when deeper stacked, you simply are not going to play for 500 big blinds with second pair. Accordingly, in the shallow sim, the nuts, or the primary threshold for hands that can play for stacks on many runouts, is probably going to be around top pairs plus, which the button has a clear advantage in. However, in the deeper sim, the nuts are probably around sets plus, or maybe if we're stretching things out on dry runouts, two pairs plus, which the small blind has the advantage in. And this in turn means that in the deeper sim, the max bet for the button, its ceiling, should be limited. So the next logical question is, how do you determine what that ceiling should be? Well, probably the easiest way to think of it is to figure out what the ceiling is when you do have the nut advantage, and then if you don't have the nut advantage, it means that your ceiling should be significantly below that. As a general rule of thumb, when you have the nut advantage, your strongest hands will want to bet an amount that allows you to go all in by the river if you bet the same percentage of the pot on each street. This, in theory, should maximize the proportion of villain's range that he needs to defend, compared to if, for example, Hero just went check, check, jam. Now, we should note that there are, of course, exceptions to this general rule, particularly as stacks get shallow, where certain hands may just want to go all in on earlier streets, especially as the SPR gets closer to one. But in deeper spots, geometric sizing will generally define our bet ceiling for our strongest hands when we have the nut advantage, and in other situations, our bets should be a fraction of that ceiling, which usually translates into bets ranging anywhere from 10 to 80%. Okay, so after we have established what our bet ceiling should be, the final step in our heuristic is to allocate our hand to its actual appropriate bet size up to that ceiling based on villain's equity distribution. Although in a vacuum, our strongest hands will want to always bet the ceiling, since one half of the EV equation is based on probability, it's important to choose a size that will be called by a significant portion of villain's range. One way to think of this is that you want to choose a sizing that will give as much of villain's range as possible a difficult decision. So if villain has a lot of weak hands that will auto-fold to almost any bet, then you'll usually want to use smaller sizes. But if villain has many mid-strain hands that will continue facing a small bet, then you'll usually want to use a larger size. And if villain has ample proportions of both weak and mid-strength hands, you can usually split your sizings. Now we should note that there are other factors that impact bet size as well, such as position and the street, but these impacts are usually more nuanced, so to keep things simple for this video, we're just going to focus on these two primary steps. So Linus decides to make a very small raise, and we see that the solver does like to raise here with ace-nine suited. According to Aurora, this play is a function of Linus's relatively polarized equity distribution that mostly consists of ace-x plus, which is essentially the nuts at this stack depth, and air, the very low equity hands we talked about previously. This sort of range will have an incentive to attack the medium strength hands in Davies range such as pocket kings through tens and queen x, which he should have a decent proportion of three-handed button versus small blind, especially since he likely see bet range. Now you might be wondering why a strong hand like aces or ace queen would want to raise in this spot given the shallow stacks. Well certainly Linus could have chosen to go down the check call route instead, and both Aurora and the solver acknowledge this. But one downside to playing passively in a situation like this is that it could allow Davies mid-strength hands like under pairs and draws to see the river very cheaply by making this tiny c-bet and then checking back on the turn. So even though there's barely over a pot size bet left, Linus's value hands do have an incentive to take the initiative to control the size of the pot in a way that will result in as much of Davies weaker range calling as possible, and as mentioned earlier, Generally, this will mean multiple similarly proportioned bets over each street. And we do see, against this very small raise, that there is hardly any folding in Davies' shoes, as virtually all paired hands and all draws continue. 
So the turn is the deuce of spades and Linus continues with a small quarter pot bet, which we see the solver likes with almost all of its range. So let's again analyze this bet through the lens of our heuristic. First off, who has the nut advantage? Well, with the SPR now being less than one, the threshold for hands that want to play for stacks on clean runouts is probably around top pair. On that basis, Linus's bet ceiling will be the amount that will allow him to play for stacks by the river by betting the same percentage on each street. In this case, since the stacks are shallow, this just translates into a very small bet on the turn and river. And when the geometric size is very small like this, what tends to happen is that the betting range becomes more compressed and merged, meaning that it will usually be comprised of some strong, medium strength and weak hands. In contrast, when the bet sizes are larger, the medium strength hands tend to stop betting. But as the optimal bet size gets lower and lower, these sorts of hands begin to accrue more EV when betting because there will be more worse hands that can call and they also can benefit from protection with a smaller efficient bet. And so since the geometric sizing in this spot calls for a small bet, we don't need to move on to the next step of our heuristic. We can bet this small amount almost irrespective of the composition of villain's range because due to the small sizing, the small blind's entire betting range is compressed. But what would happen if we were deeper? Well, let's implement the exact same turn ranges in a deep stack sim to find out. In this scenario, we see that the solver uses the half pot size with significant frequency, which allows the small blind to grow the pot a bit more with its stronger hands. But the solver does not use the larger sizings even when the SPR is very deep. So why is this? Well, with the SPR now significantly higher, we have to go back and re-evaluate this spot with our heuristics starting from the very beginning. So step one, who has a nut advantage? At this stack depth, top pair and probably even two pair won't be very comfortable playing for all the chips if the opponent has a significant possibility of holding a set. And the button holds a very strong advantage in sets here because the small blind should have been less likely to raise a set on the flop when the SPR was short. Accordingly, the bet size ceiling for the small blind on the turn should be limited due to the fact that it is less likely that he's holding a hand that can play for stacks. And just to solidify this point, if we alter the ranges a bit by forcing Davy to 3-bet most of his strongest hands on the flop, thus removing them from his turn range, we see a major shift. Now, the solver favors a 150% pot overbet in Linus' shoes because he now very clearly has nut advantage. But when we then import these exact same ranges in the short SPR sim, we see that still the solver only uses the quarter pot sizing with a merged betting range due to the small geometric sizing. So Davy calls, which according to both the solver and Aurora, may be a mistake with pocket jacks. As the ranges get tighter and tighter, you generally have to become more and more selective with the hands you defend with, even against very small bets like this. This is because optimal defense is based on the percentage of your range that you should call or raise with, not based on the absolute number of defending combos. And so it would seem that Queen X is a better bluff catching candidate given that it blocks more value, unblocks more bluffs, and has a higher chance of improving against top pair. King Jack and King 10 also appear to be better defending candidates as they should be plenty of bluffs and can also draw ahead to the nuts if behind. The river is the three of clubs, which is pretty much a brick, but it does equalize all top pairs ace, jack, and below, including Linus's hand, so he shoves. Though the solver is pretty much indifferent between shoving and checking with Linus's combo. On the one hand, shoving will gain more EV from weaker combos that would likely check back, such as under pairs and queen X, but on the other hand, checking will gain more EV from bluffs like missed straight and flush draws, which top pair will bluff catch against 100% of the time in Linus's shoes. So when deciding what to do here, Linus needs to assess whether it's more likely Davy has a medium strength hand that will bluff catch or a weak hand that will bluff. And given that Davy has pocket jacks here, whereas the solver pure folded this combo on the turn, it's probably safe to assume that Linus's play to shove instead of just checking is the right one and Aurora agrees. Aurora also notes that there may be some micro leveling going on here between the two, where Davy is calling down light because of Linus' reputation of loving to bluff, and in response, Linus may be punishing a range that he thinks has too many of these sorts of bluff catchers, which appears to be the case. 
And to round out our bet sizing analysis, if we take these exact same ranges and plug them into the deep stack sim, we see that the small blind hardly bets at all, and when it does, it uses a small sizing. And this is attributable to the fact that the button has a much higher proportion of full houses in its range, which were just not as important in the short SPR sim because the threshold for stacking off was much lower. In contrast, if we remove all full houses and two pairs from the buttons range, we see that the solver then go absolutely ham in the small blind shoes, firing a massive nearly 400% pot bet with over half of its range. This is because on the river, the geometric sizing is to go all in regardless of the size of the pot. And finally, in Davy's shoes, if we node lock his turn range to call with a few pocket jack combos, we see again that the solver prefers to just fold this hand and prioritizes calling with king queen or kings as jacks block more bluffs, specifically jack 10. So ultimately, Linus gets absolute max value with his ace nine, and a big part of how he was able to do this was by precisely controlling the size of the pot with his min raise on the flop and small bets on the turn and river, which were designed to string along a hand just like the one Davey was holding. If instead Linus had taken a passive check call route on the flop, there would have been a good chance that Davey would have simply checked back on the turn and then folded to a larger river bet. But as played, a great example of how one can eke out additional EV through a masterful manipulation of bet sizing.